Chapter 17 is about security strategies and documentation. And this is for the 10th edition. So the objectives for this chapter are to explain how to secure resources on the network, physical and logical. In other words, how do we do it via software? But there are physical considerations that have to do with securing access to data and servers. User authentication is important and user education is also part of this chapter. Uh, other important things are to recognize malicious software and how to remove it. Now we've done a lab on that, on virus removal, which is very much a try many different ways, many different antivirus programs until you get some confidence that you have removed it. And that is one thing we can do to protect data on personal computers, not to mention backups. We also need to be able to describe policies that address issues of change management, regulated data, software licensing, because we don't want illegal software, incident response, how do we respond to a virus attack or a worm, and data destruction and disposal, how to properly erase and destroy data and get rid of it. So protecting network resources is part of the chapter. We're going to look at physical and logical methods of protecting computer resources, securely authenticating users on a large network. You know, how do you prove who you say you are? Educating users to understand their roles to protect and secure network resources. I have to do annual cyber security training, and even though I could answer the quizzes in my sleep, for this, I have to go through this, I have to watch the slides in the presentation, and then I have to do the quizzes. So it's annual training I'm required to do, but it's obviously going to be much more useful for the less computer savvy person. So what are the best practi practices for physical security and access control? Uh, keep really private data under lock and key. Anything that's on a network or is on a computer that is connected to a network can be accessed one way or another. If it's really important data, keep it behind a locked door or in a uh, safe or something. Uh, door locks and safe operation uh, safe options include key locks, combination locks, and biometric locks. So your server rooms should be behind locked doors. Your switches and routers should be behind locked doors, your servers, your print servers, your file servers, all that should be physically secure. Now on servers or different systems, you can have locks so people cannot open the computers up to add a card to it or to pull a hard drive out to make an image of it. Laptops, you can put on a cable lock or uh, it's very often called a Kensington lock by the company that is very well known for these that will let you secure a laptop to a table leg so that it cannot just physically be carried off if you get distracted or turn your back on it. You can even go so far as physically putting locks on the USB ports in a, in a secure institution where you don't want to give somebody the ability to copy data onto a USB memory stick. So you can physically block the access to the exposed ports. Uh, you can use privacy screens on your laptop screens and computer screens, and that blocks out a wide angle, so no, it makes it much harder for somebody to do what we call shoulder surfing. Uh, here is a system lock. This blocks one of the screws, and until you take that lock off, you cannot unscrew that screw to take the side case off. Here is a Kensington laptop lock that goes in a specialized notch of the laptop, and then you can loop it through the desk or loop it around the leg of a desk or something, because it only takes a few seconds for somebody to nab a laptop. It always really puzzled me when uh, the restroom we had over in our old building, the administration building, that it had a shelf on one side of a wall and then the restroom was on the other side and people would leave their backpacks on the shelf out of sight. And it just takes 
three seconds for somebody to duck in there, see a laptop, see a lap, uh, see a backpack, grab it, and be out the door and around the corner before you can really get out the door. So don't overlook physical security. Don't leave a laptop or a backpack or a laptop bag in plain sight in your car because it only takes somebody a minute to shatter a car window and grab that backpack or grab that laptop. You want that stuff out of sight. Uh, here are some physical locks for USB ports and you can see that they're plugged into the ports and they're wired together so you can get different things like that to keep it sealed to make sure nobody is accessing the USB ports or Thunderbolt ports on a computer. What else can we do for physical security? You can have uh, in, uh, etched metal ID uh, port where you use a, how do I say this? You, you have a metal etcher that you can put a serial number on a part or a name on a part, says belongs to. We used to put security tags on computers at the college that you basically could not peel off. Uh, getting into secured areas, when I worked at NASA, we had what we called man traps, which was a double door. You had to go up to a security console. You had to put your badge in it, which it read. It had a camera. Uh, when you put your badge in, the security guard at the other end of that camera would see on their computer would see a picture of you and could compare it to who was standing at that doorway and then they would unlock the door and you could go in. And when that door closed, then you could open the second door. So you never had both doors open at once. So that's called a man trap. And uh, usually, like I said, you've got to have a separate form of ID to, to get the door to open, and then there's somebody overseeing that. So, and they might have a, a list of, you know, of course, if you're putting a badge in a reader, it's going to say whether you're allowed into that space or not. But, like, uh, I needed it to access a room called the Mission Evaluation Room, the MER, where engineers went to support their subsystems during spaceflight. And it, but my card was not keyed to get into mission control. So I couldn't go into the mission control rooms or the mission control back rooms because I wasn't authorized for those spaces, but I could go into the MER, the mission evaluation room. So in, in sensitive areas, you want to have that kind of thing in place. Uh, logical security and access control. Other types of software-based security measures include antivirus, anti-malware, regularly looking for suspicious type files and scanning the computer, uh, email filtering, you want something on your email system to filter out the phishing attacks so that uh, people don't get an email that they think is from somebody inside the company and they click on a link. So those are not perfect, but they do help because uh, it keeps you from getting an email that's trying to social engineer you or whatever. Uh, trusted software sources, you can only download software from trusted publishers and providers. Access control lists that say which user is allowed to do what. Authentication is proving who you are. Access control is what are you allowed to do now that you have proved who you are. Uh, making sure you don't have unauthorized devices plugged into a corporate are your institution switches. That's port security. It can say only this MAC address for this network card on this laptop is allowed to be connected to this switch. And if a different MAC address shows up on that switch or too many MAC addresses, a brand new device shows up, it shuts that port down because somebody unauthorized might be attempting to gain access to the network to scan and try to find things out about it. Like at NASA, they have what they call the flight control network, and no office personal laptops are allowed to be plugged into those ports, and only the authorized devices that are flight control and looking at the data from the space station or the spacecraft uh, are allowed to be plugged into that, and if a non-blessed device is plugged in, it instantly causes a security violation. The port is shut down, and people come looking for you because that's a serious thing, because if you're hooking a non-authorized device up to a secure network, you could be getting a malware or a worm onto that network, and you don't want anything 
to uh, be able to get onto that network that could compromise command and control of the space station or software being able to get up to the space station. Uh, now, MAC address fil filtering and port security, MAC addresses can be spoofed fairly easily. So this is not the end-all be-all. Uh, VPNs, virtual private networks to encrypt data over a remote connection or the public internet so that data cannot be spied on. Other issues you want to get into is mobile device management. This is BYOD, making sure that it is implementing security, policy enforcement, data encryption uh, requirements, uh, remote wipe cap uh, capabilities. If people are bringing company laptops off-site and one of them gets stolen, we want to be able to send a command to that device the next time it hooks up to a network to erase itself. And we do want the data when it's sitting on that machine cold, when the machine's not booted up, it is encrypted. So nobody can access that data. They can't pull the hard drive out and move it to another computer and try to get the data off because it is heavily encrypted. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Authentication. Besides a Windows password, you can increase authentication security by enforcing a password pol policy that requires a minimum length password with a certain complexity and how frequently it must be reset. Now, if you make this policy too strict or you make people reset their password too often, it becomes counterintuitive. It's actually anti-security because if somebody has to change their password so often that it becomes burdensome to keep coming up with new passwords, they just end up writing it down on a piece of paper and taping it to the bottom of their keyboard or tape it in inside their desk drawer or they take the same password they had before and they add a letter or a digit or a symbol onto the end of it. The thing that I really recommend to have better security is two-factor authentication. If you have not set up two-factor authentication on your personal email address, you are taking a big risk because if anybody ever guesses that password and they have access to your email, just about every website you're going on to, your user ID is your email address, and they can log on to it. They can say, forgot password. It will send the link to your email, which they have access to, and they have locked you out of because they have changed the password because you did not have two-factor authentication set up. Anytime I try to log on to my Gmail, I have to go into my Gmail app on my phone and say, yes, that was me logging in somewhere else. Because if I don't do that, it won't let me log in. So if I log into Gmail on a new web browser, it's going to send that message to my phone. Now, it can also be set up to send you a text message. It can be set up to send an email message. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can send an email to a different account. So two-factor authentication is to see if whoever's trying to log in knows their Windows password, possess, possesses a token or a smart card, because two-factor authentication could be a smart card. You have to put in a smart card reader on the laptop as well as typing in a password. That's how NASA does it now. That's how the military does it now. And uh, it can do things like it can monitor the way you type your keystrokes, the cadence uh, the, the speed between keystrokes, uh, that is a signature that can be unique. Uh, biometric data, you might have to use your fingerprint reader. I have to use a fingerprint reader on my phone and on my brand new MacBook Air I got. It's, it has a fingerprint reader, so you have those different things as well as traditional type in a password. But two-factor authentication, I highly recommend it for all of your important accounts. Uh, user authentication continued. Hardware security tokens. This can be a smart card that has a little embedded microprocessor that gets powered up when you plug it into the reader, and it has encryption keys on it. Or you can have a key fob that once a minute is generating a code that you have to type into the device you're going to log into. And it, it will know if if you have typed in the right code. But if you do not physically have that key fob, even though you have the password, you cannot log in. 
other things we can have are uh, software security tokens. This could be a digital certificate for a website is the most common. So the website is proving that it is authentic and it has been approved by a certificate authority. And there have been some problems in the past with certificate authorities approving certificates for non-trustworthy people trying to emulate somebody else or claiming to be an organization and getting a certificate for that organization so now they can create a fraudulent website. So one of the basic security tenets of this really is Bank of America or this really is Microsoft is only as safe as the certificate authority that that website is using. If you have a certificate authority that is not doing its dual, dual diligence, you can have uh, problems. So uh, here is a smart card reader uh, being picked up near field communications. Here is a key fob with a six digit code that has to be typed in to log in successfully. Uh, here's two factor authentication to get logged into Facebook. 2FA means two-factor authentication. Uh, here is a certificate that you can click on to see that this really is Google because Google's digital certificate is provided by Global Sign Incorporated. Uh, HTTPS, encrypted websites, are dependent upon the quality of the certificate authorities and there's only been a few instances where that that quality, that trust, has been a problem. Uh, the integrity of the internet depends on those certificate authorities only issuing certificates to legitimate organizations. In 2017-2018, Symatech issued 128 bad certificates to the point that Google Chrome and Firefox would not accept any certificates as authentic from Symatech period. So if those companies that had certificates with Symatech wanted their websites to be recognized as valid, they had to move their certificate authority to a different authority, another a different certificate authority. And you can find more about this if you read this Ars Technica article right here that I have in the PowerPoint. And ultimately Symatech sold their certificate authority part of their company to another company because they just ruined their reputation. And uh, so I, I don't like their antivirus and the fact that they were not handling uh, HTTP certificates properly just uh, lowers my trust in them even more. So authentication services are really broken into three parts. AAA, authenticating, prove, who you say you are, authorizing, what are you allowed to do based on who you are, and accounting, what did you do? So I have logs of what you did. Uh, two popular solutions to AAA services for large networks are RADIUS, remote access dial-in user service. This is to connect to wireless access points, and uh, TAC-ACS. Now, I don't know a lot about either one of these, but basically they let your wireless credentials roam throughout the network, and I'm sure they do a lot more stuff than that. Uh, here is some compare and contrast on RADIUS and TAC ACS+. Plus. I'll let you read this. Uh, you can see there are different features of both of these. You just Basically, what I want you to know is know these exist, and therefore... They are for AAA, Authenticating, Authorizing, and Accounting. User education. Okay, users need to know what acceptable use policy is. In other words, you can't run your small business on your company's computers, your private business, what they can and cannot do. Important security measures for users. Never give out your password to anyone. We will never send you an email asking you to type in, to click on a link and type on a password. Uh, type in a password. We will never do that. If you ever see that and it claims it's from the IT department, it is phishing.
it is a fraud trying to get you to type your password into their website so that they can access uh, access that your network through your username and password because they've tricked you into giving up your password. Do not use the same password on more than one system. Seriously consider using a password manager that will generate extremely complex passwords for each website and everywhere you are and then all you have to do is have a very good password memor memorized to get into your password manager. Uh, be aware of shoulder surfing, people looking over your shoulder to get your password. Uh, you know, that was a pretty common practice in high schools for students to kind of look over their teacher's shoulder to see if they could get their teacher's credentials. Uh, lock down your workstation each time you step away. Windows button lock to lock the keyboard. And the only way to get back into the computer is to type the password. If you have man traps or security doors, make sure you look out for tailgating. Only one person is allowed to go through the door at a time. Make sure nobody is following you in. Okay. Uh, also used when someone continues a window session. When you do not lock your worst workstation, somebody else can use the computer as if they are you. So watch out for these things. Hackers are going to try to access this, this information. It could be something as simple as physical dumpster diving, looking for useful information in somebody's trash. Then we have phishing, spear phishing, impersonation, and spoofing. So phishing is a type of identity theft where the sender of an email scams you into responding with personal data. Sphere phishing is a hoax email that appears to come from a company that you already do business with. Sphere phishing is they know something about you so they can make the phishing attack look more reasonable, look more real. Spoofing is where the scam art artist makes both emails and websites look like the real thing. So an email message might look like a link, but it actually leads to a malicious script or a malicious flash or a malicious download. So uh, my rule of thumb is anytime there's a link in an email, I do not click on it. If it's a website I think I need to go to, I will go to the main website directly, but I will not use the link because what the link says may not be where it's bringing you. Uh, so here is a phishing email. And of course, if you were to download wordplay underscore confirm dot zip, you'd be getting the malware onto your computer. User education continued. Uh, a good site to debunk virus hoax or email hoaxes or any kind of security hoaxes is snopes.com. Uh, the author says securelist.com and virusbtn.com. I have not tried these two. I have used Snopes multiple times to verify the authenticity of a security rumor. Uh, rules to protect a laptop when traveling. Always know where your laptop is. Keep it with you. Never leave a laptop in an unlocked car. Never leave it a laptop in plain sight in a locked car because like I said they can bust that window out almost immediately. When at work lock your laptop in a secure place or use a laptop cable to secure it to your desk. So those are some good tips. So dealing with malicious software or viruses or malware, uh, malware, malicious software is any program that means harm and is transmitted to a computer without the user's knowledge. Grayware is uh, annoying software that might or might not have intended harm. So you can have grayware, you can have apps on your phone that are getting all your contacts and uploading them. They are scanning your clipboard continuously to access your keyboard, even though that game has no reason to access your clipboard. Uh, you have apps that want your precise location all the time, even when they have no reason to know your location. And the phone operating systems are getting better about warning you when apps want those kind of access so you can limit it. And I have uninstalled apps from my phone because games that or like looking at my keyboard, or wanted to access my photos, or access um, my contacts. It's like, no, you do not deserve to be on my phone if you're going to be doing that kind of behavior. Uh, virus is a program that replicates itself by attaching itself to other programs. So the 
the virus has to get on your computer somehow through a memory stick, through an email, through a USB hard drive, through a network share. Uh, it might be a macro in a Microsoft Office program. It might be a file on the Windows file system. It might be a bootloader program that when that device boots, it activates the virus. Uh, spyware spies on a user and collects personal information. It might be a key logger. It might be looking for your contacts. It might be looking to see if you have your credit card stored somewhere on the hard drive. Uh, worms are programs that using network APIs, features of the operating system, can copy themselves to different systems on your network without it being delivered like a virus. So a worm can replicate itself from machine to machine to machine because of a vulnerability in the operating system. And they can overload the network and they can spread like wildfire. Uh, Trojans is a program that it tricks you into running. It pretends to be a legitimate program and you often download it from a website the user is tricked to opening. You know, you're going to try to get a, a utility for your PC and you get it from the wrong website. So you're getting a bastardized or hacked version of that program that also includes malware. Rootkits are probably the worst one because they load before the OS boot is complete and they can hide in the boot managers. They can hide and run your operating system as a virtual machine, so they're very hard to find. Uh, they can hijack internal Windows components so that they're living inside of a Windows file. So this is where a good a virus scanner or things like the system file checker can look to see if files have been modified and then some malware is what we call ransomware, where what it does is encrypts the data files on your computer and gives you a message and says, unless you pay this fragment of a Bitcoin worth this much money, uh, we're not going to give you the de-encryption key to get your data back. Now that's where you want a good backup and you tell them to go to hell. And you, you go verify that you've got a good backup that is not encrypted, and then you can reload your data and you don't care about the ransomware. That's why it's so important. Another reason why it's so important to have good backups. Another very good habit is to not run as administrator. If you're running with user rights, most of the way viruses get into your computer is you have administrator rights and they're running at kernel mode levels so they can modify the operating system. So a rootkit is running in kernel mode or administrator rights and it can circumvent all those security features of the operating system versus user mode. A uh, zero-day attack is a virus or malware that has not been patched, okay? It is day zero. Nobody has responded to this attack yet. So it, these can be extremely serious, and if you see an out-of-the-ordinary emergency patch offered or issued by Microsoft on Windows Update, for a not, it used to be Patch Tuesday with Microsoft all the time, and if they if they issued if they issued a patch on any other day, then you knew it was for some sort of emergency security hole. Uh, man in the middle is a this one is complex. It's kind of hard to describe, but basically, say I'm creating an encrypted connection to Gmail.com. Man in the middle is a piece of malware between me and, and by the way, it can be legitimate software between me and Google. It pretends to be Google, sets up an encrypted connection between me and Google, and then it contacts Gmail and creates a different encrypted connection. So now the man in the middle has the ability to receive an encrypted connection from you that you think is going straight to Google decrypt it, look at it, re-encrypt it with the other session to Gmail and send it on, and it's sitting there in the middle, and you never know there's somebody sitting in the middle. Now, there are some businesses and corporate institutions that do this. So uh, if you are accessing your personal email or websites that have encrypted connections, it could you have no expectation of privacy if you are using your company's computer or your institution's device. So they could be doing man in the middle 
legitimately when that data is leaving your corporate website going out to the public internet. And they might be just doing that because they want to make sure you're not trying to steal corporate secrets or you're doing something inappropriate. Uh, denial of service is where a large number of computers send traffic to a website or to a web service to bog it down, to overload it a variety of ways. And this is usually from virus-infected computers, typically called zombie computers, that can be remotely controlled from the bad guys, I'll call it the bad guys' lair. Wherever they are, they can command these thousands of computers to suddenly start sending a certain type of traffic to a certain website to bring it down, to overload it. So that would be a distributed denial of service attack because they're using a whole bunch of computers involved in the attack. And these are usually computers that have malware on them and the malware kind of lays low waiting to see if it's going to get a con command and control message from the people that got the malware on your computer. Uh, a zombie is a computer that has been hacked. That's what I was just talking about. A botnet is an entire network of zombies. So they could all, you know, you might have 100,000 computers or 10,000 computers that are zombied and can all be commanded to start sending certain types of traffic to a network website to bog it down, to cause it to crash, to cause it to be overloaded. A uh, dictionary attack is a way of attacking passwords by brute force by using the words in the dictionary, usually inserting one or two digit numbers throughout the word to try to have a better chance of getting somebody's password. Uh, and this is not done by repeatedly trying to log in because too many failed login attacks will lock that account. The way this works with a dictionary attack or rainbow attacks is somebody has gotten the password file and stolen it off the server or the computer or the website and offline they are trying a dictionary attack to see if they can figure out what the password is versus the encrypted passwords that are stored on the machines. And I will talk about this in a part of the course where I talk about encryption. So what are we up against? Uh, Non-compliant -compli systems. Uh, this would be systems that are not under your corporate control. This might be BYOD, bring your own devices. There needs to be some way to scan them and make sure that they are not doing something on your network we don't want them to do. Like typically if my phone is connecting to the Sanjak network, it has no access to anything else on the Sanjak network. It's just giving it a Wi-Fi connection and then I can get to Blackboard, I can get to email, I can get to SOS, I can get to those kind of services, but not, I'm not on the network per se. I can't see any other San Jacinto in devices in the room I'm in. I can't see those computers on that network. I'm kind of on my own little private network that just gives me access and then I can try to authenticate to Blackboard or SOS or whatever else I need. So. There are programs you can buy, such as System Center Configuration Manager by Microsoft, that can scan these non-compliant devices. All right, so if we have malware, how do we mitigate that? How do we remediate it? What do we do? So here is a step-by-step -step attack plan to clean up an infected system. Step one, identify and research the malware symptoms. Some warning signs that suggest uh, malware, pop-up ads, you don't see that much anymore, rogue antivirus software, slow performance and lockups, internet connectivity issues, application crashes, uh, blue screens of death, operation, operating system failures, system and application log errors, problems with files, problems with email, problems with updating anti-malware software are invalid digital certificates. Uh, so here the malware has disabled the malware program on your computer, the antivirus program. So Windows Defender has been disabled or whatever third party one you have. So whatever PC Keeper is, this may or may not be a legitimate antivirus program, but it has turned off Windows Defender and this is your antivirus. 
So it may be trying to portray itself as a legitimate antivirus program, but it actually is the virus. Uh, you can use the certificate manager to look at the certificates that are on your machine and see if you need to manage or delete any of those. If a, if a certain step in removing a virus is to get rid of a certain certificate, you can use the certificate manager to do that manually. Step two, we want to quarantine the infected system. We want to get it off the network. Uh, if it is connected to a wire to wireless network, immediately disconnect it. Quarantine computer is not allowed to use the regular network, so it can limit the chances of a worm or something spreading. If you need to download anti-malware software, disconnect the other computers while the infected computer is connected to the internet. Uh, connect the infected computer directly to the ISP. Uh, boot into safe mode with networking gives you a better chance of the virus software not being on it. You could put the antivirus software on a memory stick you do not care about and plug it into the computer, but then do not plug that USB memory stick into anything else unless you're going to format it to make sure it didn't get malware on it. Before cleaning up the infected system, back up the user data to another media just to be safe. But be aware that you may have malware on that media now. Step three, disable system restore because the malware may have been on there long enough that it has embedded itself in drivers or certain settings in Windows. And if you ever roll back to an earlier restore point, you could be re-enabling the malware. So if system protection is on, uh, Anti-malware software can't clean the protected folders of system protection. To get rid of the malware, turn off system protection and then clean the system. And then once you're sure everything is clean, you can turn system protection back on. So that's control panel, system window, system protection. Step four, remediating the, remediating the infected system. So before selecting the anti-malware software, read the reviews and check out reliable websites for the antivirus software. Uh, Microsoft Windows Defender has a good reputation. There are others that have good reputation. I believe AVG, uh, Avast, although some of these tend to put so much crapware on your computer and bog your computer down that I'm not sure you want to leave them on your machine afterwards. We like uh, House Call by Trend Micro because House Call does not have to be installed. You just run it. Uh, if the infected computer will not boot, you can boot with a third party operating system to run the anti malware, uh, like a live Linux. You can put the hard drive in another computer and scan it from the other computer, as we did on a lab assignment. We can launch into Windows uh, recovery environment, do a startup repair to get the startup files repaired. Uh, we want to run several different antivirus programs and run a full scan, and this will take hours. Uh, I'm not sure run anti-malware software from a networked computer. Uh, yes, you can do that install and run anti-malware software from the infected computer. This is harder to remove it. Install and run anti-malware software in safe mode. That's a, some viruses do not get active. It is much harder to remove software, malware, from the infected computer if you're running it on the infected computer. That's why they're talking about running the anti-malware from another computer. Run an anti-malware scan before Windows boot, in other words, from a live CD or DVD. Uh, run more than one scan of anti-malware software. So, step four, we're still on remediating the infected system. Clean up what's left, uh, what's left over. We might see if there's any startup errors that need to be cleaned up, things that need to be removed from the registry, or search malware types and program files to see if there's any manual steps you have to do to clean up after the virus, if there's any folders or files that have to manually be deleted because the antivirus program couldn't do it. Like I said, if there was anything in the registry, uh, clean up your browser and uninstall unwanted programs. So here is a uh, Windows Defender that found malware 
and it's asking you what you want to do. We want recommended action is remove. Okay. Here are the malware installed a program called BuzzDoc, so we want to uninstall that. Step five, protecting the system with scheduled scans and updates. Once your system is clean, you want to keep it clean. Three best practices to protect the system against malware are use anti-malware software, use a software firewall, and keep your windows up to date because most of the windows patches are security patches. And you, if you don't have the most up-to-date version of the operating system software, you are going to have vulnerabilities to viruses. Known vulnerabilities. There's unknown vulnerabilities all the time. But keeping your system up to date will protect you from all the known malware. So it can any, any security vulnerabilities that have been found and have been fixed, you want to make sure those are on your machine. All right, so once you got everything cleaned up, you can turn system protection back on. You can create a restore point and go on your way. Step seven, educating the end user that clicking on that link, clicking on that link in the email, going to that website, that shady website was not a good idea. Clicking on the first link you see in your web search is not the best idea. If you're trying to get something from Microsoft, make sure you go to Microsoft.com. So this is an ongoing process to educate the user so that they are doing things that that are sound, that they're that they stop doing the unsafe, the unwise actions. Uh, I know of a couple companies that that would do things like they will send out a phishing email with a link in it, and everybody that clicks on it is required to go to in-person security training where they have to sit in a room and listen to somebody talk about it. So it's very much meant to be a punishment. Okay, your first warning is don't do that again. Take this online training. Your second warning your second warning is you have to go to this really annoying training that's very boring where they tell you this stuff again. So there they're doing some social engineering just to, to make people do something unpleasant if they've done the wrong thing. So they will think about what they're doing the next time they go to do it. All right. So best practices for documenting and security policies. Uh, your security policies need to be written and, and on good documentation. The way you've set up your security needs to be documented. It needs to set expectations and standard for security in the entire organization. So this part of the chapter is going to talk about types of documentation, security policies you might encounter, and what is generally expected of you as an IP, IT technician. Knowledge base. This is a collection of articles, text, images, videos that give information about a certain network product. Inventory management. You've got to know what you have so you can go through and say, these are all the devices we have. Are they all patched? Are they all up to date? This security notification just came up from Microsoft. We need to query all our sub-organizations in our company to say, have you patched these systems? The government and many, many, many corporate institutions are going that were using the SolarWinds product are having to go through a very arduous, detailed, tedious process to make sure these machines that have solar winds are patched before they're allowed to go back on the network. And this is servers. This is not end user computers. Uh, inventory management. If you don't know what you got, you can't have a way to see if they've all been updated. Uh, password policy. We've talked about password policy. Network topology diagrams to know how your network's laid out, what networks are where, what institutions are where. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, change management, tracking what has changed and when. So change managed well means people affected by change can make a smooth transition. transition. Okay. Uh, change management is a part of project management. You've got to keep track of all the things going on and what's changing in your organization. 
uh, how new software will affect people, how patches might cause side effects. Have you gotten the patches everywhere? You've got to keep track of the changes you're making to your organization. So change management is a very important process. So what have we got here? Purpose of change. Initial request of change. Has it been approved by the change board? Then we've documented it. Okay, we've implemented the change. Now we've got to research. Was it successful? Was it on time? Did the users accept it? Did it, was it on budget? So that's the general flow of change management. So you're documenting your business processes so you know how your company does things. So you can look at streamlining possibly an efficient and cost-effective service, excellent customer satisfaction, a superior product. You need to do these things because you want these end use you want these end results. So the purpose of change is you're not changing something just to change it. There has to be a reason why you want to go through this expense of changing something and there should be a control board, a change advisory board to say no this change is not worth it. Uh, change plan and scope this is uh, documenting what the change will involve. You know, what if we're going to go from Microsoft Office to Google Docs? Okay, that's a big scope of change. We need to look at the key components and what what abilities that is that going to give us and what is that going to take away and how much training is going to be involved and how much extra user support is going to be involved. And could it fail? Could it just not work with our organization? So we have to do risk analysis, okay, and see if it's going to cause uh, possible, are the consequences so dire that we do not want to make this change? Uh, back out plan. We try it. It doesn't work. We need a plan to get back to where we were before we tried this. Uh, end user acceptance. You've got to get buy-in from the users. They need to know what is the purpose of the change? That the leadership of the company agrees with the change. How the change will affect them in their job and how to get individual concerns and questions answered. And that they will get the necessary training. And then you should also ask the users for a request for comments. Get feedback from the users. Change management also includes making sure you update documentation because everything that's changed must be documented. If your documentation's not up to date, like your network map and you're trying to track down what servers could be affected and there's servers out there you don't know about, then you're gonna be in a world of hurt when you're trying to make sure all these servers are patched. Uh, let's see, there are legal regulatory requirements you're going to have legal government regulations that you have to follow or you're breaking the law. The documentation you must do. Each industry may have an accrediting body or an institution that says you have certain certifications to do business in this field that is recognized by your vendors and recognized by your customers and they want you to have that. So to stay certified in that way, you have to, re you have to follow their regulatory and compliance compliance policies. This could be, uh, you, there could be regulations like in, in, in higher education, there are a lot of restrictions on personally identifiable data, health information, of course credit card data we want to keep safe if we're collecting those from people, and there are like the European Union has its own set of rules, so it's different from country to country to country to area to area to area. So you got to watch out for all this stuff. And I have to be trained on what information about a person I can identify, I can use. Like, for instance, in email, I'm not supposed to send any grades. Uh, I will sometimes send out an email and say, your assignment is graded. You can see the grade on Blackboard because Blackboard is password protected. Email can typically not be encrypted. So somebody along the path between me and you could look at that email and see your grades. Uh, I do, you know, there are certain things that I just... I'm not supposed to put in emails, and it's not a good policy or habit. Software licensing. If you're using software in your company, you're buying licenses that gives you the legal right to use that software. 
but you don't own the software. The software is copyrighted. That does not give you the right to make copies and give it out to other people. And you need to follow the end user license agreement, the EULA. That's the thing we always click on I accept without actually reading, but there can be dire consequences. Uh, software piracy is against federal copy, the Federal Copyright Act of 1976. And uh, if you have a disgruntled employee, if you have illegal software and you have a disgruntled employee who's leaving the company or not, you know, they might just turn you in. So you need to make sure your company is legit on all this stuff. And you don't want to give your users the right to install copyrighted software themselves because your company will get in trouble because you will have some users at your company that will do that. So here's your typical uh, end user a licensing agreement and you have to say I accept to continue to actually install the software. Don't forget if you have an incident that happens uh, somebody who's accessed content they weren't supposed to has broken copyright law that stuff has to get documented. Uh, first responder duties identify and go through the proper channels preserve data and devices, and incident documentation may be things you all have to do. Data destruction, okay? Uh, if we're getting rid of a computer, we want to make sure that the data that's on it, which may have personally identified data or have credit card numbers or anything that we're not allowed to release, gets destroyed before we release it. If it's a, a magnetic storage device, we can override the data on the drive using a, a certified data destruction program. Uh, for solid state drives, because of the way they work, you have to use a sec secure erase utility. You basically command the device to erase itself so the data can never be recovered. Uh, it can go as far as running the hard drive through a hard drive shredder. So at the top you have a hard drive, at the bottom you have little bits of metal. And plastic. For magnetic devices, you can put them through a strong magnetic field, a degausser, which will clear all the magnetic charges on the drive, uh, paper shredders, and use a secure data destruction device. So here's a hard drive shredder. Or this may be a degausser, I'm not sure but it is erasing all the data on the hard drive. Hard drive shredders are very satisfying. You can look at uh, videos though on the internet and uh, there's it would feel very comforting to do that just to shred a hard drive. They say some of the people that have the most job satisfaction is building demolition people that just knock things down. Think about that. You get in a fight with your significant other, you go to work, you don't feel well. So to take it out and get it out of your system, you knock a building down. But speaking of that, we have reached the chapter summary. So I will leave each one of these slides up on the video long enough for you to pause the video if you want to read through these. And we've covered a lot of different subjects in this chapter. And the last lab of the semester usually is now a data encryption lab where we look at securing data on devices. And here is the very last slide, slide 64 out of 64. And with that, I want to thank you. And if you have any questions, you know how to contact me. So please take care.